Can you hear me? Okay, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. And today I'm going to talk to you about ways to discover regulatory information uh, in RNA. So let me start by reminding you of the centrality of RNA in the gene expression program. Of course, we remember that in the nucleus, there are long non-coding RNAs, sometimes called link RNAs, that help to configure the chromatin state uh, and can control transcription factor activity. This is a topic uh, that's dear to my heart and to my lab's work. After the messenger RNA is made, there's, of course, much regulation in messenger RNA splicing, localization, translation, and decay. What I'm going to talk about today is actually attempting to extract regular inf information from uh, all the sequence data. So the people working in the RNA field confront the following problem. You have all these sequences rolling off of your sequencer. But if it's a protein coding gene, you can very rapidly blast this against the database and gain many insights about domain or organization and also functional um, portions of the biomolecule of interest. And you're off to do some very hypothesis-driven directed experiments. But if it's an RNA, we pretty much uh, don't have uh, the same kind of information. So how do we overcome this kind of a challenge? In thinking about this problem, this is analogous to a historical problem that's been solved. So this, some of you may recognize, is Egyptian hieroglyphics. So this is a language written in the ancient world, but for a long time, the meaning was lost. This problem was solved uh, when Napoleon's soldier found this uh, tablet called the Rosetta Stone, where the same text was written three times, once in hieroglyphics, once in Egyptian, and once in Greek. And by going back and forth, uh, you can see which characters were repeating and then uh, would then repeat it in the known language. Sorry, just some kind of feedback. I'm going to step back. Um, and so by this kind of correspondence, it was eventually worked out uh, that the meaning of the individual letters, and then this allowed uh, the um, archaeologists to read not just this text, but all the texts in the ancient world. So with the same kind of idea, we thought that we need to base the other... Okay, not really sure what's going on. I'm going to put my phone further away and step back from podium. Okay. So the problem then, the, the goal here is that we want to be able to describe uh, really many of the features in RNA and then associate these individual features with functional consequences. So that's what I'm going to be telling you about for the next 20 minutes. So in thinking about RNA, we know that information is encoded at two levels, at the level of the sequence and also a level of structure. And that's because RNA has a unique capacity to base pair with itself and with other biomolecules to form complicated shapes. So really, we can only have a full understanding of the regulatory information when we describe an RNA uh, structure. So guided by this idea, several years ago, my lab, in collaboration with the lab at Iran Segal, proposed the following strategy for global strat methods to map RNA structure genome-wide. So this method starts with the idea of taking RNA that's folded in vitro uh, or in vivo, isolate them, and then digest separately with two different enzymes. One enzyme that cuts only double-stranded regions, which then uh, generate a 5' phosphate that can be uh, ligated, cloned, and sequenced, and reveals information that those particular bases were in a double-stranded configuration. And this, by the same strat analogous strategy, RNA's S1 only cuts single-stranded regions and generates, again, 5' phosphate that you can, again, uh, ligate clone sequence and telling you that those bases were in a single-stranded configuration. And so by, then by calculating a profile, a ratio of the two kinds of reads, you can then get a, a, a profile of the RNA structure. So by this way, we try to turn a structural problem into a sequencing problem, and then we can then use the sort of modern-day sequencing technology to gain genome scale information. So this was first applied to the yeast transcriptome, and just by align, just lining up the, uh, the number of reads uh, on, uh, let's say, a model of the, on average, the genes, we found that there's actually a systematic pattern of organization uh, to yeast uh, messenger RNA transcripts. For example, the coding region being more structured uh, than the non-coding region, the 5 and 3 prime UTRs, but these are demarcated by two global minima, uh, the start codon and the stop codon. And so uh, the start codon accessibility, we found, was associated and predictive of the level of translation efficiency. Uh, there's information uh, in the coding sequence. You might notice that this is, uh, the, the signal appears very squiggly. This is not an accident. The Fourier transformation shows that this has the exact periodicity of three. It's a consequence of the, uh, the genetic code and the dinucleotide frequencies that it imposes. There's additional information uh, in, in the uh, uh, 
when instructors deviate from the expected average across the transcriptome, uh, there are oftentimes information for cytotopic localization of transcripts to, to distinct regions of the cell. Okay, so this is just by simply aligning and, and averaging the reads. More recently, we've developed a strategy to accurately reconstruct uh, the RNA structure based on experimental data. So this is the pipeline that we call Seekfold, and this uh, the software is available for download here. So this is two there are two parallel strategies here. On the left-hand side, we're starting with sequencing information, and we can take many kinds of uh, sequencing-based uh, RNA structure probing experiments. And the first steps involve just turning the sequencing information, calculating the appropriate p-value for whether the base was in a single or double-stranded configuration using a binomial test, and then discretizing that information into basically yes or no, whether it's in a single or double-stranded configuration. So many kinds of data can be processed this way. In parallel, we're going to ask um, what kind of RNA structure best fits this particular kind of experimental, experimental profile. And so here we're not constraining the folding algorithm, but rather we're letting the folding algorithm sample a Boltzmann weighted um, average of a, basically a thousand different structures. And then we ask which are overrepresented uh, in a statistically meaningful fashion. And so we cluster these structures. Uh, into, uh, here's a uh, kind of the uh, two-dimensional uh, plot of the principal components into families of structures. And then we ask which centroid of these structures is closest to that we determine by experiment. So for example, if the profile of the experiment's here, then this is the family of structures, and this being the centroid, that wins, and that is the predicted structure. So this algorithm, we found, has several advantages, including uh, accuracy, robustness to noise, uh, it can take multiple input data types, and of course it can scale genome-wide in a very comp computationally efficient way. So uh, using this algorithm, we can then uh, learn some additional insights, for example, into the yeast transcriptome. Uh, so one example is that we found there's an unexpected correlation between uh, the extent of RNA accessibility, particularly in the first 20 uh, to 30 uh, uh, basis, and the presence of uh, so active chromatin marks, acetylated histones, uh, H3K4 trimethylation, uh, which suggests some sort of association between um, nascent transcription and chromatin marks. So in mammalian cells, the presence of double-stranded base pair RNA is actually frequently associated with silencing histone marks, especially by polycomb. And in yeast, there's an opposite uh, kinds of a correlation, which is the interesting hint that awaits further verification. On the post-transcriptional side, we can then also then re-examine uh, data for RNA binding proteins and when they uh, bind to RNAs. It's known that many of these motifs are rather degenerate, and so they can occur frequently across the transcriptome. Many of those instances are not actually bound. And so here we found that this particular uh, protein, uh, PUF3, prefers to bind a single-stranded uh, motif. So uh, compared to the, this is a uh, rock curve, showing that compared to just counting motifs, uh, a set, integrating the information about accessibility, uh, you start doing a better job predicting where the RNA binding protein binds. Okay. So this, um, this body of work then is just looking at really uh, sort of a snapshot, a single look at RNA structure. And so we have also wanted to start looking at some dynamic pictures of RNA structure changing. And the stimulus we focused on uh, was actually temperature. Because uh, in many organisms, temperature is an important sign of habitat or season for migration, mating, uh, for plant flowering. For many pathogens, it's an important switch uh, for the pathogenic form. And of course, uh, in mammals, uh, there's the heat shock response. It's a very important homeostatic mechanism for dealing with infection, but also for other kinds of diseases. And so the experiment we, 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 we chose then was to perform this parse experiment, but with temperature elevation. And so imagine that at one temperature, a baseline temperature, there are two sets of double-stranded bases. But like any hybridization experiment, there's an energy barrier. And so at a higher temperature, maybe one set of structures would unwind and melt, and the other set would stay. And so that would give us additional information about the energetic stability of different RNA structures uh, in, this, uh, uh, in, in this ensemble of structures. So here again is what the data will look like. We have four piles of double-stranded bases. We don't know which ones go together, but by this trick, we can tell this is one set and this is potentially a different set. And so um, this also gives us information, uh, direct measurement of free energy of RNA folding. It's kind of like RNA calorimetry, but genome-wide. So we then, uh, again, using the yeast transcriptome, perform now 10 parse experiments. Each column uh, is, an, is, is a sample. Each row is a base. And you can see then from uh, kind of how the bases line up that there are actually these sharp single transitions that permit us to map uh, transcription, uh, to, to, to map 
multi-temperature genome wide. I actually mentioned that this actually used the step minor algorithm that David Dill, who's sitting in the front row, developed, which allows us to then match by template these uh, transitions. So you can see here, for example, that these spaces were double-stranded at 23 degrees, then they melt and they go away. So the melting temperature must be between these two temperatures, and then so on and so forth. Okay. So what we learned was that there's actually uh, distinct melting temperature patterns for non-coding RNAs versus messenger RNAs. Uh, there's a difference in the polarity of messenger RNAs in ORFs. But I want to focus uh, and spend the time to talk to you about RNA thermometer, which is the kind of regulatory element that was not well known in mammals. So in bacteria, these RNA thermometers are actually a major form of temperature um, uh, regulation. So uh, they're so named because uh, these, uh, the, the start side for translation, the Shaudai Gardner sequence, is occluded by RNA uh, double uh, secondary structure at the baseline temperature. So they cannot be translated. But at a higher temperature, this melts, and then translation starts, and then you start making a bunch of heat shock induced proteins. But this kind of mechanism, whether it exists in eukaryotes and how many uh, of these thermometers uh, exist, uh, are actually debated. So in our data, we can see that there's something like 2,000 instances of RNA thermometers in the yeast transcriptome, but they're connected to a different kind of output. Instead of causing more translation, we found that the melting temperature of, of, these, of these transcripts are actually highly correlated with the extent and the severity of RNA decay during heat shock in vivo. So that is that the RNAs with sort of low melting temperatures, lots of thermometers, they degrade very quickly, and the ones that have higher and higher temperature are more and more stable. In addition, these RNAs uh, with, a different with different melting temperatures actually fall into distinct biological classes. The RNA thermometers are enriched uh, in ribosome, uh, ribosomal proteins, whereas very stable um, uh, elements actually are present in regulators of the infolded protein response, such as this NASA regulator, HAC1. So we thought there's some sort of mechanism to coordinate the decrease of protein synthesis and upregulation of the infolded protein response in this RNA stability. This data also suggested that some element of the RNA decay machinery must care about RNA structure and can, and can discriminate the structure between 30 and 37 degrees, which is the heat shock temperature in yeast. So what could that be? So through a lot of thinking and uh, analyses, we realized that the exosome was actually uh, the main regulator reader of the RNA thermometer. So the exosome is the major enzyme in cells that degrades RNA. It's a three prime to five prime exonuclease. And it's this cage-like machine where uh, the, uh, there are multiple proteins that formula, so this lid and this barrel, but the active site of the enzyme is actually at the bottom of the base. And so to actually access this active site, you have to unwind your RNA, thread it into the cage, and that requires about 30 bases of single-stranded RNA to reach this active site. So indeed, we found in experiments that the exosome knockout selectively stabilized RNA thermometers during heat shock, and more that the purified recombinant exosome preferentially degrades uh, RNA thermometers when they're in the, he the heated uh, temperature. So the, this, this complex is able to directly sense and read uh, uh, these kind of thermometers. So the last sort of, um, sort of uh, idea is to show that we can actually make artificial RNA thermometers. By designing sequences that have different degrees of uh, stability, we can make them uh, less and less accessible to the exosome in that they do not degrade by the exosome when they're more stable. But some of these uh, structures are actually designed so that they unwind at 37 degrees. So you can see then that we can then confer temperature-dependent degradation by the exosome in this kind of design, but not when the melting temperature was designed to be much higher. And so this, then, uh, so this series of work suggested then that indeed RNA thermometers are widely present uh, in the yeast transcriptome, but they're actually connected to RNA decay rather than increased translation. And furthermore, um, this has an interesting concept that when we think about regulatory elements, we usually think about some sort of a sequence or maybe a specific secondary structure. But here, the regulatory information is actually in a, an energy profile. It's the fact that these structures melt at a specific temperature that endow them with this regulation by the exosome. Okay. So, so far, I've told you about a number of experiments that use RNAs, which are acting ex vivo. And more recently, we have been pushing to do this kind of analysis in living cells. And this was made possible by development of a new chemical probe uh, designed by my lab and a lab at Evercool at Stanford that penetrates cells and labels single-strand bases with very fast kinetics. So you can see that in mouse embryonic stem cells, one minute after addition of this compound into the media, we start to label all the single-strand bases, and it's complete in about 10 minutes. 
So this is actually the structure of the uh, 5S RNA reconstructed from our data, which matches beautifully with that seen by X-ray crystallography. This uh, compound uh, is, is able to be applied to really all the model organisms uh, we tested so far and works in the nucleus and the cytoplasm. So with one power with this kind of approach is that we can actually now rapidly ask what's the structure of the RNA in living cells versus isolated ex vivo. And that actually turns out to be very informative. So for example, for the 5S RNA, we found that when we see differences in vitro and in vivo, it's not that the RNA has taken a completely different shape. It's more that in vivo, the RNA is actually involved in regulatory interactions with proteins and other RNAs. And those sites all show up. This is verified by the crystal structure, and it turns out that when this RNA is systematically mutagenized, each of these sites that are involved in these interactions are critical for function. And so this suggests in a very simple and rapid way to find actually functional pieces of RNA through the in vivo in vitro comparison. So we believe that in vivo shape will allow an integration of RNA structure biochemistry and genetics because you can now look in RNA structure in any biological state or in cells knocked out for any gene of interest. Okay, so so far I've told you about a number of ways to keep describing RNA structure, but what about function? So when we're thinking about predicting RNA function, we want to learn some basic information like what is the unit of, of regulation or unit of information? What is the information to generate? So this is a concept that's not new to biology. Uh, the genetic code for protein synthesis in the, is indeed degenerate. So different versions of the, the, of the, of the message mean the same thing. Does it involve, and finally for RNA, we want to know does it involve RNA sequence and or structure? And so these are all questions that we think could benefit from a systematic mutagenesis of the RNA and followed by a, a functional interrogation. And so uh, we've uh, embarked on this approach and this is enabled by a new uh, te technological platform uh, which we call RNA Matomi. This is a microfluidic device that my lab devised in collaboration with that of Steve Quake at Stanford. And so it starts, uh, it goes as follows. So it starts with a DNA microarray, that's the template uh, for each of the RNAs that we're gonna make. But on top of that, we place a microfluidic device. The device has multiple wells and a valve and a button that can be pushed down at will. And so in this, in this, in this uh, chamber, we can actually in vitro transcribe the RNA, capture that uh, through a scheme uh, that involves a, a FRET, so then we can actually have co-transcriptional folding and quantitation of the RNA without any chemical labels on the RNA itself. So this device has a uh, current version 640 wells, but we can make thousands of, of these wells. And so that's what the device looks like. Um, an interesting point here is that this device is different from a microarray or from a flow cell because each well is actually a, a separate experiment. We can run 640 different conditions, different proteins. We can have multiple proteins come in and out. We can withdraw the analyte at the end of the experiment or have a different small molecule in each different well. That's for, so from that perspective, it's different from, let's say, a microarray. Okay, so onto this uh, RNA array, we can then flow across, then let's say, fluorescent protein. So if you're interested in RNA protein interaction, capture the protein and then interrogate uh, the amount of binding. And so the first test case is with an, uh, an RNA called histone mRNA three prime loop, and there's a stem loop binding protein. So you can see that from each of these wells, we've made this RNA at equal levels, but only the well type uh, uh, RNA binds the protein and the mutant does not. And the quantitation sh here shows that the dynamic range is something like uh, five logs. It's a highly um, high signal to noise and very quantitative. So using this tool, we're gonna actually do a systematic structure function analysis. What we've done is to, do, to mutate every single base and also make every double mutant to make the compensatory mutation. So if we have a G and a C, we're gonna change the G, let's say to an A, then we're gonna ask, also, then if we change the, the counterparty to a U, does that restore uh, function, okay? So now, uh, this now has lots and lots of data points, and so we think the following way is a good way to visualize this kind of data. It's a two-dimensional plot. Every dot is a, it's a mutant. On the first axis, on the, on the y-axis, is the effect of the first mutation. So if, if this is 100% up here, if we make mutations, some of them uh, decrease function, so then uh, the mutant is down here. And so there's a class of, of, of mutations that have, you, you can mutate them, it's neutral, there's no impact on function. Then there's a second class, there's a second separation. So when you make the second mutation, uh, there's, a, there's some mutations that when you uh, make them, uh, there's a defect, but they cannot be rescued by the compensatory, compensatory mutation, whereas there are others that are fully rescued by compensatory mutation. So we infer then that this is a class of mutants that is important for structure, whereas these are important for sequence. 
And so we can systematically walk through and find out where they, each of these bases are. So then to summarize this particular experiment, this figure actually summarized something like 2,000 different mutagenesis experiments that we did. So it shows you that everything that's important for a function for this motif, we call this the functional motif. So you can see that for this particular structure, it's the, the actually mostly the RNA structure that confers information. So this uh, long stem here uh, has to be uh, present as a stem, but the bases on the sides can be actually anything as long as they base pair. What, then in addition, what matters is that it has to be a G at the second position and a U up here in a single-stranded configuration. So this is the um, it's really the interplay between structure and sequence for this functional motif. So having this information then also helps you recognize additional versions of this motif in the genome or cross evolution, as you might expect. So for example, we compare what we learned from the human sequence and compare that across uh, evolution, you can see that these absolutely conserved bases, they're absolutely, or sorry, required bases uh, by sequence, they're absolutely conserved. Whereas these other bases that uh, we think are important for structure, they very much co-vary across evolution, as one might expect. There are also novel specificities that we learn in here uh, that are not obvious, or we have better refined interpretation uh, for the uh, uh, comparative uh, genomics, which then we think is the, uh, this offers an alternative strategy and complementary strategy to give functional interpretation uh, to conservation data. So in summary, uh, uh, I told you that there are several new technologies that I think will empower systematic decoding of RNA structure and function. Uh, there's PARS for genome-wide description of RNA structure. We can now describe these structures in vivo and through systematic mutagenesis assign function to different RNA motifs. So I think the future, I think, should be bright, should be a very interesting time for a global discovery uh, in this space. So uh, I've been fortunate to work with many uh, talented individuals. Uh, the work on PARS and PARDI was done by Yue Wan, a graduate student, who will soon head her own group at Genome Institute of Singapore. Uh, Zhen Qing uh, Ouyang uh, developed the SeqFold algorithm. Uh, he will soon be joining the uh, uh, Genomic uh, Medicine Institute at Jackson Labs. Uh, PARS, uh, sorry, the uh, Shape in Vivo is done by Rob Spitali in collaboration with Eric Kuhl's lab at Stanford. And Lance Martin developed the RNA Mitomi work together with Steve Clegg. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Howard, thank you for a beautiful talk. Uh, two questions. So the first one is uh, if you look, if you compare of these uh, RNA structures, the temperatures, the thermometers, um, the temperature sensitive structures in mammals versus species, uh, this microphone is going in and out, uh, then what you found is that there's this global difference in the mammals. My question is that tells you something about conversion evolution because it's not some, like some regulator is sort of contacting all of these RNAs and therefore they're responding in cis and therefore the regulator is sort of what they're responding to. This is each of them making an independent response to this temperature sensitivity, which in mammals has gone down the sort of regulate degradation route, and in other it, it, it has gone down the, you know, route. So I think we need a new battery here uh, going in and out, or it's me. Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. So, so first, just to clarify, the, uh, the comparisons between bacteria and eukarya. The eukarya we said was yeast, not mammals. But oh, okay. we're interested in making the mammal map too. I'm, I'm very interested in, in sort of talking to you and the audience about ways of trying to prove whether it's really convergent evolution or something else. But we're now trying to make systematic these uh, RNA thermometer maps for different kind of species. So of course, many species live at different temperatures, at different set points. You might imagine even the same species, let's say plants, that live in the tropics versus, uh, like, let's say, up in the you know, subtropic, uh, sorry, subarctic uh, temperature, right? So they would have different set points they must have for deciding when to flower and when to you know, do different things. And so it would seem to be some sort of highly adapted response, right? But um, that also means that there must be, pro I mean, molecules that sort of help on the trans level, basically, either specific translation initiation or degradation proteins right. that, are, right. that are sort of that's responding right. to that. That's right. Um, my second question is, when you're looking at this, um, at, at your functional assay of, uh, you know, the, this mitomi, so my, um, could you confuse some uh, sort of, could you call them sequence uh, level if, uh, in fact, they're interacting with something else? In other words, are you sort of controlling for other kind of environments by sort of doing everything in a well? And could it be that some additional, um, so when you, when you go back to the evolutionary constraint, did you find that, in fact, your assay captured all the evolutionary constraint that, that you could find, 
or is there additional evolutionary constraint that might correspond to sort of interactions with other molecules? Okay, I'm glad you asked that question because there actually is something very interesting. So at this, you're asking, do we find everything that's already learned in evolution, right? So the answer is no. Uh, so basically, most of these things were, were, we, we, we discovered, but for example, notice this uh, C15 here. This is absolutely conserved in evolution, okay? And, but this is not required in our biochemical experiments. So first, this, because of this result, this was long assumed by the entire field that this must be absolutely required. So even though people worked on this for 20 years, they never actually made a mutant and tested it. So we did it, and of course the answer is that it's not required. So my collaborator was shocked, so he did it again and got the exact same answer. So that says that even though this is absolutely conserved, there must be some additional constraint, not the binding to this one protein. There's some other reason why this base has to be a C. Okay? And so that's, for example, one example. But one, part one of case. it could be the fact that you require additional mutations in order to explore that space. For example, the U over there the, with a G. Uh, that's possible. So, so yeah, we started to make a, some, you know, like double mutation combinations. So, for example, I mentioned that each of these stems, right, the, 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 the stem is very important. You can tolerate loss of any one single base pair, but if you have any two or more, then the whole thing is shot. Right, so you, of course you can add, add this, build up this kind of picture. I don't want to monopolize the questions. I have many more. If there's no other, I, I'll continue. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you, you've, you've shown how you can do this for very small structures at a time. I, I mean, an obvious question is what about larger structures? I mean, uh, at, at what level are these interactions local? And now that you can uh, extend this to such large scale, I'm wondering perhaps if that, G, that U up there interacts with the G down here. I mean, this is a very local example. That's but right. in much larger structures, I'm just wondering by exploring the combinatorics in this way, whether in fact uh, A from your sequence mutations themselves, you can pinpoint to these additions that might exist, and then B, given this extremely large number of experiments that you can do, whether you can exp start exploring in a guided way these additional large-scale interactions. Right. Right. I think a lot of the RNA structure are mostly local, and we have two lines of evidence to support that. One is that we've done some experiments where we actually taken a like, full-length transcript, probed the structure, and they made deletion mutants, right? And so if they were really long-range interaction, when you delete, let's say, some five prime piece, there'd be a lot of changes in the three prime piece. That, that usually that's not observed. The second one we know that is that we now have made a human PARS map. And of course, this is diploid cells with SNPs. So the impact of SNPs are usually local. They're really not like you know sh super widely extended, so I think most of the, the structures are going to be have local impact. Fascinating. And then the obvious uh, follow-up question would be, what about link RNAs now? Do you also find that they have such local structures? And yes. uh, you know, given that they are long by their nature, is it just a tethering, or is there any additional sort of? Yeah. So link RNAs have a lot of structure, and we think that a lot of the actions actually in the structures rather than the flexible linkers, and so. Like the idea of a beads on a string, you can think about link RNAs that way as well, that they're flexible regions, but there are important structural elements kind of interspersed on that. That's, that's just based on some small number of link RNAs we've studied this way, but that's the current thinking. And lastly, to connect your talk to a lot of the morning sessions about these regulatory motifs, yes. my question is, um, now that you're able to sort of detect these things at the RNA level, what about RNA-DNA interactions? Have you started exploring that? Well, so as you know, we, we proposed this particular method called CHIRP, uh, which is like a chip, but with an RNA. So we can map where the RNA is bound to chromatin and sequence the underlying uh, DNA regions. And actually, in some of these experiments, we actually very readily detect an enriched motif using all the tools that people were talking about uh, this morning. And that doesn't necessarily give you to then the final answer of what is the actual mechanism, recognition of those DNA bases. In my mind, that's still not yet solved, but we oftentimes see sequence preferences in these kind of experiments. Fantastic. Thank you very much.